Okay, well, good afternoon. So why don't we get started. Um, what we're going to do today is, is we're going to finish up section two of chapter seven. So we're talking about the standard normal distribution. And we said last time that the standard normal is a specific type of normal distribution. So if, the, if we have some random variable that itself is normal, and we look at the z-scores for that random variable, they're guaranteed to be standard normal. And what standard normal means is that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. It's the only standard deviation that we actually give its own name. And we're going to see why. And of course, this is our notation, right? So we remember that when we want to write a, a normal distribution, we want to say something is normally distributed. This is our random variable z, usually with capital letters, is distributed normally with a mean of zero and standard so the first number is the mean, the second is the standard deviation. So what I want to do is I want to kind of look at these, uh, at this old example that we did where we had the salaries for two cities, so then we put the bad in there for two different offers, right? We wanted to compare those, we couldn't because they were from different distributions. And so I want to, I want to use this example to kind of show you why we call the standard normal standard. Okay, so. We started off, we said, okay, there's this uh, job offer from New York City, and the salaries in New York City are distributed like a normal distribution. The mean, which is the origin here, right, of the distribution is 60, and the standard deviation is 10. And so when you're working with normal distributions, it's a really good idea to kind of sketch these things out, okay? The origin is always going to be the mean, and then you're literally going to use the standard deviation as a minimum measurement here, okay? And of course, there's our data value, 75. So this is where it sits in the population. And then we had a salary offer from Daytona Beach, and we said, okay, for the Daytona Beach salaries, the mean was 45, the standard deviation was 5, and we can make a, a similar diagram. And our salary offer was 5, 59K, so there's where it sits in the population. And when we asked which one is better, notice that at this point, we don't have to even really compute anything, right? Because we automatically know that this is the mean, this is one and two standard deviations above. So this value is between one to two standard deviations above the mean. And if we look at this value right here, this is the mean. And this is two to three standard deviations. So we know this, this z-score is larger and positive, right? So without even doing any calculations, we can automatically know that the Daytona Beach salary is a uh, better offer. Now, key, the, the key thing to remember is that the larger the z-scores, the less likely that value is, is to occur, okay? And obviously, positive z-scores are above the mean, so we want a large positive number, okay? So one of the first things we want to look at is why do, why do we think that the z-score has a normal distribution? And what I want to do is kind of go through a little construction to, to convince you of this, okay? So if I start off with the, the New York City salaries, okay? This is the distribution for New York City. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to subtract the mean from all of these values, okay? So all I've done here is I've just subtracted the mean. So now 60 becomes 0 because that's the mean. 
65 when I subtract 60 off the front side, and so on. And you're totally convinced that this is a normal distribution, right? Because all I've done is I picked it up and I've just moved it. Okay, so it hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is the standard deviation, I mean, the, the mean, right? The mean's now at zero. And the standard deviation is the same. So at this point, you're convinced that this is a normal distribution, no doubt. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to divide by the standard deviation now. So now, zero is still zero. Five becomes one. I'm sorry, 10 becomes one. 20 becomes two, and so on. Notice that this is where our data value is. It still sits in the same place. Okay. So the two things that we want to take away from this, first of all, that this has a normal distribution. Maybe not so obvious when you scale the variable, it still has a normal distribution, but it does. It's certainly bell-shaped, okay? Mean is zero, standard deviation is one. So hopefully this is kind of a little bit of a, a visual argument for why we think, and, and, and of course, what is this at the bottom? These are, these are the z-scores, right? So this is the, so we found out that the, for the New York City salary of 65, the z-score for that data value is done by five, okay? So, Couple things to take away. First of all, z scores so if x is a normal random variable, we can say two things about the z scores, okay? We can say first of all that the z scores have a standard normal distribution. That's one thing. So that means that if you give me a value of a z-score, I can automatically tell you the percentile. If you give me the percentile, I can tell you the z-score because I know what the mean and the standard deviation are. The other fact that's really important is the fact that if I have a data value x and I know the percentile for some data value, We usually call this small x, right? What we know is that the percentile for its z-score is going to be exactly the same. So its z-score has the same percentile. And those are two really important facts we're going to use a lot. And you can kind of see this here, right? You can see that this is where this data value stands in the population. Its z-score stands in the same place. And if you remember, when we actually did the empirical rule, we stated a form of the empirical rule purely in terms of z-scores, right? So I, I would have drawn something like this before, and right below it, I would have put minus three, minus two, minus one. And the empirical rule holds for z-scores. So data values, if I, if, I, if I take a data value and I look at its z-score, they're going to have the same percentile, right? The same area in their data. And so I can do the same thing with the Daytona Beach, right? I can I can take that distribution to Daytona Beach, subtract off the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and that's what it gets. Now you can kind of see why we call it a standard normal. Because standard here is kind of standard in the sense of like the gold standard. Remember when we used to actually have a good economy, right? We have to this thing called the gold standard, and everything's been very relative to gold, right? Well, isn't this the same thing that's happening here? We're basically comparing both of these data values in this standard normal distribution. So notice that I start off with this New York City. I can plot him in the standard normal distribution. Daytona Beach, I can plot him. So this is the kind of the import of a standard normal. It says that I can compare all normal distributions using <coughs> the standard normal distribution, using the z-score. It's standard in that sense. Okay. Okay, any questions about standard normal? Everyone's good on that? And we've worked a lot of problems. Yeah, okay. Can you give me a definition of standard normal? It's, 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 the only, it's the only normal distribution that has its own name. So it's a normal distribution that has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, and really it's just the number, it's really just the distribution for the, the z scores, right? That, that's all it is. Okay. So this is a really important slide, okay? 
This is kind of a recap of what we've done, but the thing that you really have to be careful about is that in order for any of this to hold true, the variable you're starting with has to be a normal distribution. If I had taken any other distribution, like some weird right skewed distribution, and I did that same thing, I shifted it and scaled it by the normal distribution, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look like a nice bell-shaped curve, right? You can kind of see that. You shift, the, you, you shift a right skewed distribution, it's still right skewed. You scale it, it's still gonna be right skewed, okay? So in order for any of this to be true, you always have to start from normal distribution. Once I know this, I know these scores are gonna be standard normal. So, you know, one question you could ask is, well, why do we need the standard normal? All this is kind of cool and everything. But notice that I could have solved this problem with the salary and perfectly fine if I had ever used the standard normal, right? I could have said, okay, the, the New York City salaries, they have a, the distribution has a mean of 60, standard deviation of 10. And I could have said, okay, what's the percentile for 75? I've got an answer, right? And I could have done the same with the Daytona Beach salary. So why do we need standard normal? Well, we're going to see there's actually a lot of reasons why we need it, but here's kind of an example of a problem that you can't solve without using the standard normal. So I want you to read this problem for a minute. Kind of think about it. Maybe think about how you'd set it up and solve it. So when we solve a problem like this, and kind of from this point on, most of the problems that we're going to be solving are word problems like this, okay? You have to kind of puzzle through it, literally. Just like you do with a puzzle, right? You solve a jigsaw puzzle, what do you do? Take all the pieces out, turn them over, sort the colors, the edges, right? You do the same thing, you kind of break this down. So how would we start off solving the problem like this? You could draw it out. What would you, what would you draw? I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, so so one so one suggestion is to, to kind of draw a standard, oh I'm sorry, just to draw a normal distribution, right, with point two. Okay. Right, you could draw this. Hmm. Let me think. What's what's going on in the problem? What's happening? So you run a, you run a company that kills soda water. Okay. The government has regulations. If you advertise sixteen ounces, and preponderance of you know the bottles are like fifteen point eight ounces you're gonna get in trouble for fraud, right? If you advertise 16 ounces, and the majority of the buildings are like, uh, uh, the majority of the bottles are like 16.8 ounces, you're losing money to your company, right? So what's going on in this, in this problem? What are, we, what are we trying to do? Keep uh, margin of error respectful. Yeah, I don't know what margin of error is at this point though, right? We haven't even really talked about that. We're trying to keep it as close to six two. But something's five percent. What's five percent? Uh, <clears throat> and when is it underfilled? Exactly. So here's so here's kind of the idea that the, the average bottle size, okay? The average bottle size is you know advertised to be 16 ounces, right? And what I and what I really want is I want a distribution, so what? What's gonna happen? Well, 16 is down here, right? And there's five percent of the day, there's five percent of the bottles that have less than 16 ounces. That's what we be considered under fill, right? That's what I want. I want this, I want this distribution. Okay. What else do I know? 
So when you take apart a word problem, what you want to do is you want your eyes to go to the numbers. You want to ask, what are those numbers, right? So one of the numbers I see is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 ounces. So that's a standard deviation, right? This, this machine's filling up the bottles with a standard deviation 0.2. And I think that's it. So what we're actually trying to do is we're notice that the standard deviation, the width of this distribution is the same, right? I'm basically sliding it around. I want to figure out what is the mean. So what I what I actually don't know here is the mean. I'm trying to slide this distribution that has a standard deviation of 0.2 in such a way that 16 has 5% is left here and 5th percent left. How am I going to work that problem? So we have a relationship. Okay, so we're going to start with this with this relationship. So I know that there's a relationship between a data value, and I, I do have a data value of 16, right? The mean, which is unknown, and the standard deviation, which is 0 0.2. And that relationship's the z-score, okay? So what I know is that the z-score for the data value okay? And I know some of this information. <coughs> what information do I know? I know my standard deviation, right? So I'm given that this is 0.2. And I'm given a data value, 16. So I have something like this now. And this is what I want. Now I need the z-score. How do I get the z-score? This piece of information I have at Q, what is that? I haven't used the 5%. How can I use that? Right. That, that's going to be the percentile for the z-score. So here's kind of the picture that we want to use to, to think about this. So here's my actual distribution. I have no idea what this is. 16 is in the fifth percentile. But if you think about that drawing we just drew a second ago, right? I, I would draw the standard normal right below it. So this is x standard normal rate below it. And whatever this z-score is, there has to be 5% in this case. Okay. So this is also the, 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 the fifth percentile. Remember, data values and their z-scores, they have the same percentile, right? So can I use this information to get the z-score in the fifth percentile? Suppose I wanted to do that. I went into StatCrunch. How would I find this z-score? I have to tell StatCrunch what? So, so, so I had to tell the direction, but before I get to that, what's the very first thing I have to tell StatCrunch? Bingo. And that's why the z-score is useful. Okay, This percentile does me no good up here. I can't use StatCrunch. I know the standard deviation, but I don't know the mean, right? But here I actually do, because the piece of information I have, the case, in, you know, the case up the sleeve, so to speak, is the fact that you do know the mean and the standard deviation. So I can go back and find that z-score. And so if you go into StatCrunch, um, and you go ahead and, do, and plug this in,
Okay. If you just want to, yeah, if you just want to make a notation, that's uh, that's fine. It's its own reward. No, it, it, it's just for my own records. So it's probably not a bad idea if you want to follow along with the exam one review to actually download it in Canvas. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time reading the overhead. It's kind of small. So it's on Canvas under exam one review. Oh, and by the way, um, on the home page for the class Canvas page, um, I, I put the location and the times for the SI. Yeah, so there it is on modules under lecture. So yeah, the way Canvas is set up, so you know, the way Canvas is set up, when you take a survey, even if it's free response, it always marks some things wrong. So I have to go back by hand and enter this stuff, but don't worry. Yeah, I would never penalize you for taking a survey. No, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, your yeah, your opinion's wrong, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what to think. Nah. But 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 no, thanks for pointing that out though. But yeah. Okay. 
So, so why don't we get started looking at exam one. Um, there's 20 problems, so we won't have time to go through all, but I picked out some that I think are kind of representative and that maybe were some of the harder ones, okay? So this was a problem where it gave you a data set. Uh, one of the things that you guys realize is when you're in stat crunch, and uh, I'm sorry, when, when you're in my stat lab and you want to look at a data set going to exam, you won't open up stat crunch. That's going to be true for all the exams. It's definitely be true for the final, because the final is locked down browser, so you can't access anything besides stat crunch itself. I think we tell IT stat crunch itself, and then just the standard stuff that's all you can access. So um, when that happens, what you do is you just copy it to the Excel file, right? Download it and load it back up, or you can just copy and paste it. Right? Either one. In any case, what they want to see is they want to see if you know how to plot a histogram and a box plot, okay? So you're going to take that data and make that plot. And then they're asking you some information about the shape and the number of nodes, okay? So you know how to do that. Um, then it asks you to identify outliers. Now in this problem, you have two different plots. You have a box plot and a histogram. What's better for detecting outliers? Which one? Box plot, right? Why? Because it's just on the right Exactly. It's just, it's just out there. Now you have to be careful though. That will only happen if you click that option telling it to do the fences correctly. Okay? If, it, if it doesn't, the box plot won't show you any outliers. It'll just draw all the way out to the max and then cut out the little box plot that you want. Um, computing the median and the IQR, you can do those right from summary stats. Cool thing about stat crunch is you don't have to even do Q3 and Q1 separately. It'll do IQR right for you. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. So the next problem was with z-score, you know, um, the way to recognize z-score, you know, is you're given the mean, the standard deviation, and then it comes out and asks you for the z-score, right? So, you know, you just go ahead and use that formula, okay? So, it gives you an uh, observation that's 14.9, subtract 8.8, divide by 1.2, and that's the z-score. And, and what they want to know is that you not only know how to compute it, but you know what it is. Just tell me the number of standard deviations above and below. And it's a number of standard deviations above, so it's a z-score positive, and there's a deviation <coughs> below. Okay. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. <coughs> if you have any questions or you want to see any of these in detail, I'm just kind of sketching out what the question was asking, just in case. Okay. So the next problem asks about data types, okay? And you're given the summarized data. The thing that you're supposed to realize is that there's really two categorical variables, right? So here you have job category here, here you have gender, right? And this is basically a contingency variable, the IQ data. And they, what, what they want to know is what sort of plot would you use with the contingency variable? <coughs> and some of these you can rule out, right? Like which ones could you rule out automatically? Frequency. Okay, and quick, that's because why would frequency be ruled out? You're right. You're looking at two different things. And frequency would just be for what? Sorry. It would just be for one. So if I had if I had one categorical uh, variable, right, I'd make a frequency for the top and mm -hmm. the So that's out. Histogram and box plot are out wide because that's quantitative, right? So all we have is either side by side bar chart or a segmented uh, bar chart. And they like segmented bar chart a lot. And that, but that's the only option that, that you could use. So these tables tend to be a little complicated. And I'll, I'll just go through this one kind of carefully. So this is a situation where you have ratings of 120 movies. And what they've done is they kind of cross-classify these movies. So they have the genre of the movie and then the rating. So again, you have a contingency table, right? Using my two categorical variables. And here they're asking for a, a conditional distribution. So they want to know the percentage of rating for the action adventure film. So what that means is I'm going to limit myself to just that row, right? I'm going to look just at the action adventure films, and I'm going to compute the percentage. Now, this is a situation where Excel would actually come in handy. Excel, you know, it, it sucks for doing statistics, but it's really good for doing repetitive calculations, right? And like database management. So what I might do is I might do a split screen here, bring up Excel. 
One of the really nice things about Excel is you can kind of organize your work. If you miss a problem, okay, you go back, you have three attempts for the exam or a quiz, you can go back and say, look at that problem, see what you did, correct it, then you can get the other problem, you know, the second attempt, you'll be able to get it. Okay. <clears throat> so what I might do is just, you know, make a little table here. So for, you know, maybe this is like problem one on my exam. And these are the genres, G, PG, PG13, and R. Okay. And these are the counts for action adventure. And so this is 3, 5, 16, and 8. Uh, I, can, I can check myself, right, by just adding them. I should get 32. Oops. So I can check that and I get 32. And so now you can go ahead and you can calculate the percentages. Two nice things about Excel when you're doing these calculations. Oops. The first thing is that I can do the drag option. So if you're doing this by hand, you have to do it a lot of times, right? But if I use this drag option of Excel, I just drag it right over. It calculates all of the percentages. The other nice option is I can set the formatting to the number of decimal places I want it to round off to, so I don't have to worry about making errors. So if you go ahead and highlight the cells that you want to format, and you right click and say Format, you can go into number and tell it the number of decimal places. So now I don't have to worry about any stupid errors following up. And then I can just pick those off. So Excel is kind of nice for this sort of stuff. And then it's really asking the same sort of thing for throw. I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'll put a number and say, do the same thing. Okay. Any questions about that? or using Excel for that matter. Okay. So this problem continues, and it says, um, it, it asks you to identify the right segmented bar chart listed. Okay, and I'm gonna move this off because this got moved. So which one of these bar charts corresponds, oops, which one of these bar charts corresponds to the data table, and how do we know? So you see that for thriller horror, it has zeros for G and PG. Okay. And if you look at the if you look at the key, the, the key is set up so that um, red, green, yellow, blue. This is G, PG, PG 13, and R. And what you notice is you notice that. For the thriller horror, there's no G and there's no PG. So for the thriller horror, you can't have any red or green bars. Okay? And so that's a pretty strong constraint. When you look at these, thriller horror has a red and green bar, red and green bar, red and green bar. Doesn't have a process of elimination, right? So there's our there's our guy, and you can kind of check. In fact, you've already computed the action and the thriller, right? You can just kind of really check and make sure that that you know comports with that that graphic here. Okay, so now we have to kind of go through these. So first of all, it wants to know if genre and rating are independent. So what am I looking for when I'm thinking about independent? If genre and rating are independent, what should happen? It means that. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so, so you know what it what it means is that it means that the percentage, okay, of G films in all of those genres are going to be the same. Okay, the same for the PG, right, and so on. 
it means that these bars are all roughly the same size, okay? That's what it means. If there was a relationship, what's the opposite of independence? If there's a relationship, right? Well, we should see some, we should see some differences, right? And we, what we might expect to see that, okay? That's, that's the idea. Okay, so are they? Um, well, let's see. Let's, let's go ahead and go through the, the possibilities here. And, and these are the sorts of ones, I just mentioned something really quick. If I was doing the exam with a quiz, okay, and I saw this problem, I would probably skip it. And in fact, you can enter zeros, right? And you can go ahead, you guys know that trick, right? You can enter zeros and you can skip ahead in the problem, okay? If I had my option, I'd probably skip this one because it's gonna require me to be really careful and I'm gonna have to really get into this problem. So I might, I might wanna work the other problems first. So we have to kind of go through these options, right? So here's what the first here's what the first one says. It says, um, let me move this out of the way. Okay. So it says, although thriller horror films have fewer G or PG movies, which uh, we know are true, the percentage of G or PG movies are not high enough to imply dependence. Okay, part of that statement is true. The other part's a little, little questionable. I'm not so sure that I think that these bars are, are so uh, are so are so different are so similar that I would say that it depends. So part of the statement is true. I'm going to put a question mark next to this. Okay, let's see if we can rule some of the other ones out. So it says um, B says um, yes. Proportions of each rating are comparable across all genres. Well. We, we know that's not true, okay? We know that if the percentage really are not the same. I mean, if you look at this comedy, this is drama, right? The PG-13 is very different, okay? And there's actually no G or PG here. So I don't believe B. I don't think that B is out there. Uh, C says no drama and total horror films are mostly PG-13 and R, with nearly half R. Okay. While action, adventure, and comedy have fewer R and a larger percentage of G in the PG-13. I'm sorry, a larger percentage of G than PG. Um, that's not exactly true either, right? So, uh, well, they, they, well they, they, they do have a larger percentage of G or PG compared to those. So that might, that, that might be another possibility. I mean, C might be a possibility. Um, no action and action adventures and comedies are mostly PG-13 and R, like this little thing right here. And that is true. They're, they're mostly PG-13 and R, with nearly half R. Well, that's not true, okay? While drama and thriller have fewer R and a larger percentage of G and PG, so I don't believe that one. So I don't, I don't believe this because um, I, I, I think really clearly that these bars are not, for example, with the blue bars, the blue bars don't, are, are all the same. There aren't the same percentage of R's. There aren't the same percentage of red bars, right? So I think we can rule out A. So C looks like it's really the only viable one. And you kind of go through them. And that's what it probably took a long time to do. And that's why I wouldn't, I, I would skip that if I could. So I'd probably say C is the is the answer. So we can kind of rule out two of them, okay, right from the get go. I mean, without really giving it a lot of thought, you can you can um, you can you can rule out A and B. They're not independent because the, the percentage of genre in each category aren't even remotely the same. So you know, if you, if you think about it and you know what you're looking for, you, you can really boil it down to say C and B. So they're they're clearly not independent. Okay. Independent would look like this. So if you looked at the bars, okay, they would all have the same height, basically. They would all be uniform. So, you know, the Gs would all be roughly the same. You know, PG would be roughly the same. A little bit of variation, okay, it would look something like that. And we don't see anything remotely like that. So if you kind of know what you're looking for, you don't have to do as much puzzling. You can kind of get to the chase. Any questions about that one? All right, 
And so here we're, we, we're in this problem, we're talking about the empirical rules. So you have a manager of a fast food a re a restaurant, and uh, we know that um, his sales, when you plot them, right, you have a bell shaped histogram with a mean of 100, dialed in 106, standard deviation 240. That bell shape is telling us to use the empirical rules, right? That's saying that we can, we can do that. And here we're told that the total sales for one day is 1,353. And we want to know if that's an unusually good day. So how do we tell if the data value is unusual when it comes from a normal distribution, a bell shaped distribution? We look at what? We want to know if the, the, the value is unusual. And so uh, the idea is that when the z-score has a size larger than three, okay, this is this is very unusual. One of the reasons why this problem is important is this is going to be really kind of the basis for what we're doing the rest of the semester. So let me just kind of give you a little introduction to the activity on Thursday. So on Thursday, we're going to start the activity. We're going to be looking at sales of airline tickets or like snowboats. And suppose we have past data, okay? So we have past data. This is airline um, ticket prices for snowbirds in the past. So you have this huge data set, okay? What happens in business is you start to notice what you think might be a trend. So maybe you're kind of monitoring it, and it looks like people are buying higher price tickets, okay? So you have a small recent data set. And you compute the mean from that sample. So you say, okay, sample, the, the average ticket price that people bought was so-and-so. Now I wanna know, is this value unusual? And one way of thinking about this is to ask, did this sample come from this population, right? If this sample came from this population, there's no change, okay? How am I gonna do that? Well, what we're gonna do on Thursday is something really weird. We're gonna take samples of samples. We're gonna take gazillions of samples, calculate the sample mean. We're gonna find out if, a, if a normal distribution. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna form the distribution for the, for the sample means from this population. And then I'm gonna look at this guy. Is he unusual, right? If he's more than three standard deviations away, then I know that a change occurred. And then I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna offer promotions or whatever, okay? So this notion of are things unusual is gonna be like really a central theme we're gonna keep going back to again and again. All right. Uh, this was a fun problem. Okay. This, so here we're given data from a survey, right? And we're looking at cost consumers from 2009 to 2013, okay? And so here are the survey results. They're asking people about their buying habits around Black uh, Friday, right? And so you notice, one of the things you wanna notice when you're reading these, these segment and bar charts is that the order of the labels is the order of the color, right? And that's kind of important because these colors are like faded pastels. They're hard, but at least for my eyes, they're like that. They're not nice, bright green, red, right? So we have to kind of know this. And so now we have to puzzle through this, okay? And so it's, it's telling us that, um, you know, we have five statements and it's asking us which ones are, are true. So let's just kind of go through them. So the first one says from 2009 to 2013, there was a decrease in the percentage of shoppers who were undecided about shopping on Black Friday. Okay, so when it's saying from and to, right, I'm looking at all of those years. So I'm going to go from 2009 to 2013. And notice that the ones that are undecided are the, are the I don't know what color it is, um, light green, I don't know. Okay, but this is this is them, right? And so it's asking, is that is that percentage of shoppers 
decreasing? The answer is no. Okay. It's staying actually pretty constant until the last year it's going to zero. But by decreasing, what do they mean? They're implying a steady decrease, right? We're not seeing that. It's kind of bouncing around six, five, five, six, and it's dropping to zero. So we know one is out. Okay. Uh, the second one says in 2013, there was an increase in very likely to shop in Black Friday over 2012. So let's look at these two years. So here's 2012. Okay. Here's 2013. All right. And now I'm looking at very likely to shop. That's the top one, right? So I'm looking at these two right here. Okay. And the question was, was there an increase? Okay. Well, if you look at the numbers, it goes from, and let me blow this up to make sure I'm reading it right because it's kind of small. It goes, it's actually 28 to 28, right? So there's no increase. It's exactly flat. The answer is no. Now, one thing to be a little careful about. Suppose, for example, it had been 28% here, and it was 27% here. Would we say that there was a decrease? If it was 28% in 2012 and 27% in 2013, would we say that there's a decrease? What do you think? Yes. Yes. So descriptive statistics, you know, there's that old, what's that old dragnet, just, just the facts, right? We just report what we see. We're not claiming that in the population there's a decrease. That's inference, right? We're making a leap to the population. I'm not saying that. I'm simply describing what I saw. In the sample, there would have been a decrease. So you have to remember, this is, this is descriptive statistics. This is not inferential. No matter how small the decrease is, if there's a decrease, there's actually a decrease, okay? Okay, so uh, we can rule out two, okay? So three is from 2011 to 2013, there was a decrease in not likely to shop, okay? So 2011 to 2013, just kind of look at those three years. Here we go. It says there was a decrease in not likely to shop. So not likely to shop is the is the blue, right? And we can see that sure enough there's a decrease. Okay. If you look at the blues, right? Light blues, they're going 35, 25, 24. So notice what decrease means. It means a trend, right? Because that really like there's a there's a, a monotonic systematic trend. So three is correct. So we know that three is going to be one of the answers. Well unfortunately you know they kind of Figured you'd know that, so there's still three possibilities, right? Three possibilities in there. All right. Um, compared to 2009, a greater percentage of shoppers in 2013 were at least somewhat likely to shop on Black Friday. This was one of the most missed questions. Anyone want to kind of step us through how we should do that? Any thoughts? Well, back to 2009 Okay, yeah, let's just start simple, right? Okay, so what, what were the two years? 2009, 2013, okay. Okay. And so what am I looking at here? Which categories am I looking at? Somewhat likely. I'm sorry? No, somewhat likely. Somewhat likely. Everybody agree? Let me ask you a question. If I have at least two coins in my pocket, how many do I have? At least two. Two or more. So if they are at least as likely, what does that mean? You're nodding your head yes. What does that mean? Uh, you probably are one that's between least likely and very likely. Exactly. So they were at least somewhat likely to shop. So it means it's, it can be somewhat likely or very likely, right? So if I can pull this up. I'm looking at these two together, okay? And actually, I just want to focus on, I, I, I really just want to focus on these two. So now we're going to add up these two numbers, right? So here it's, it's 30 and 22, so it's 52 in 2009. So 
So it's 52% in 2009. And when we add up those two numbers in 2013, what is it, 28 and 27? So we're going to get 55% in 2013. And they're asking if there was... There, and they're asking if there was a greater percentage of shoppers in 2013. So the answer is yes, okay? And of course, five is that it's not appropriate, and that's simply not true. I'm doing two categorical variables. I can, I can pull out five and then that way. Of course, it's not even an option. So, you know, the answer is if they're clever like that. So it's just going to be three and four. Again, when I see segment of bar, bar charts, I tend to want to skip those. I tend to want to put those last. They're really going to take more time. You really have to do this way. All right, questions on that? Everybody's good on that? All right. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. I won't spend a lot of time on it. You know, here they, here they actually give you the plot. What is the, what is the thing that you're supposed to notice about this plot? At this point, you can ask the text. What do you notice? Okay. And here's, here's, here's one question. If you had to describe the center and the spread, what would you use to do that? Okay, good. And so since it's symmetric, what does that, what, what, is, what is the implication of being symmetric? You can and you should, okay? Technically, you could use the median or the mean, but when it's symmetric, we're going to use the mean. Good. And that's really kind of the import of this question, that if they wanted you to know that you should use the mean. Yeah. Good. All right. This is a, I, I think of all the problems on the exam, personally, I think this is probably the, 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 the trickiest. So they give you a really small data set. And there's a problem with small data sets which is that you can't tell symmetry very well. You don't have enough data values, right? You can get really good at making plots. Things that don't look symmetric, even though it comes from a symmetric distribution. And so when you take this data set and you make the stem and you make the histogram, okay, stem and root and the histogram, you end up getting B, okay? And then it asks, some, asks you some questions, okay? Well, obviously, it's, it's, it's unimodal, okay? But then it asks you about the skew. <coughs> and really, you have to think about which of these pictures gives you a better idea of whether it's skewed. So box plot or stem and root, which one's better for skew? Box plot. I, I, I think the box plot is better, right? So the box plot shows me that there's kind of this long tail here, right? And sure enough, when I look here, I can see that. It's actually pretty hard to see. You might think this is symmetric, and maybe there's a value missing. But this suggests that it's skewed. And quite honestly, to be honest, I think it's kind of like in the eye of the beholder. I could flip a coin and go to the middle. But they, if they wanted you to say that it was skewed to the left, the reason why is because these are smaller values. Remember, when you do a vertical box plot, right? These are the small values. So if I took this thing and put it like this, the skew would be on the left hand side. Okay. But of course, once you know that, then you know that you better use the, the median for the center and not the root. So I think that was a little, a little tricky. All right, la last one. Context. So you know how I love context. So this is about um, the description of the problem is a survey of cars in a parking lot used by staff and faculty, staff and students at a large university. And what they did was they recorded the brand, country of origin, type of car, and age. Okay. So the first question is saying, who was measured? I guarantee you, on the final, there will be at least one question like this. So who refers to who was in the sample? Who was the data taken from? And there, will, there, will, there will be an example where I describe some sort of study and I'll give the name of the person. And that's not the who. You could care less who does the study. Could be somebody from Harvard, could be somebody from Tallahassee Community College, right? It doesn't matter, as long as the study's done correctly. So the who is, is, is really irrelevant. So here's the sample. Who's in the sample? Okay. And it's tricky because we're used to thinking of who as a person. But if you go back to activity one, right, what was the who in the apartment, um, in, in, the, in the building thing? It was the victims, right? That's who we were taking the data from. 
So here's going to be the cause and effect. What was measured? Again, what's the variable? It's the thing that you're writing down data on. It's the thing that you're going to fill up the spreadsheet with, right, in order to do the study. And so here there's a whole laundry list, right? You can go out and check out those. Where was it done? You know, it was done in a parking lot at a large university. Why? They didn't care. Sometimes it can be tricky. I'll try to really stay clear of things that are ambiguous. Okay, and there are a lot of ambiguous context questions in the setting, but I'll give you ones that are really clear of the context. Okay. All right, that's pretty much all for the review. Um, any questions that you have? Okay. If you have any individual questions, things that you were thought were marked wrong, you should be right. If you want to arm yourself for extra points, you know, come on in and see me. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>